As the sun dipped low over the horizon, casting long shadows across the bustling streets of Boston, a sense of anticipation gripped the city. Among the throngs of people hurriedly making their way home from work, whispers and murmurs filled the air, spreading like wildfire. Rumors had been swirling for weeks about a man named Charles Ponzi, who claimed to have found the secret to making millions. But before we delve into Ponzi's extravagant promises, let's rewind to a pivotal moment in his early life, a moment that would shape his destiny forever. It was a warm summer evening in Rome, and the scent of freshly baked bread wafted through the narrow cobblestone streets. Charles Ponzi, then just a young boy, watched with envy as his wealthy friends strolled by, adorned in the finest clothes money could buy. Meanwhile, Ponzi's family had fallen on hard times, and the once prosperous Ponzi clan had been reduced to mere pennies. This stark contrast between wealth and poverty gnawed at Ponzi's soul, igniting a burning desire for a life of luxury and abundance. He vowed then and there to do whatever it took to claw his way to the top, no matter the cost. This story starts when Charles acquired a humble sum of money following his father's death. He used it to enroll in college, as his mother had her heart set on him, attending a prestigious college to get an education. But the extravagant Charles had other plans. Instead of studying and going to class, he chose to spend his savings indulging in the latest styles and dining at the fanciest restaurants in town. Then, in the evenings, it was maybe the theater or the opera or some gambling at the casino with his wealthy friends. He liked nothing more than to attract attention. Nothing was too excessive or expensive for him. Ponzi liked to imagine that he was like his wealthy companions and that he had endless money. He tried hard to project the image of a wealthy young man, but it was a dream, and one day it all came crashing down around him. His inheritance money finally ran out, and since his studies had been completely neglected, he had no chance of graduating. His uncle offered him work as a receptionist, and that could have been a decent future. But the thought of finding a 9-to-5 job repelled Charles, who considered himself too good for menial labor. He felt he had only one option left. Travel to America and strike it rich there. If you are intrigued by real-life stories of financial triumphs and pitfalls, subscribe to Turbo Finance. We love to share content about investing, money, and real-life stories like this one. In 1903, Ponzi arrived in Boston aboard the SS Vancouver. He felt a deep shame in his heart that he had let his mother down, but his boasts of greatness were greater, and believed that the only way to redeem himself was to return to Italy as a wealthy man. The only problem was, he had no idea how to do that. America turned out to be a much-needed reality check for the young Ponzi. He was expecting to find a magical source of money and resources from heaven. But the reality was really different. There was no more inheritance money and no more relatives to bail him out of trouble. As unpleasant as he found physical labor, he had no choice if he wanted to eat. He needed to work. He tried his hand at all sorts of jobs, from landscaping to telemarketing, delivery driving to computer repair. But he never stuck around for long. Either he'd get fed up with the job and quit, or he'd get caught trying to pull a fast one on the customers and get the boot. It's not hard to see where this story is heading. Charles started stealing or begging for scraps of food and sleeping in parks. It was a far cry from his carefree days as a high roller back in Rome. And even when Ponzi did manage to scrape together a bit of money, he would inevitably spend it all on a lavish night out or a weekend getaway to remind himself of the good old days. In 1910, Ponzi figured he'd give Canada a shot, hoping for better luck up north. He landed a gig as a clerk at Banco Zarossi, a bank mostly for Italian folks like himself. It was the kind of job he'd once turned his nose up at in Rome, thinking he was too good for it. But hey, a few years of hustling on the streets can change your perspective. However, Ponzi's excitement about his new job quickly turned sour. Turns out his boss, Lou Zarossi, was running some shady business. It was like a twisted version of robbing Peter to pay Paul, using money from new customers to cover payouts to the old ones. Ponzi stuck around for a bit, probably picking up a thing or two about how to scam, before the whole thing went belly up. Zerosi was employing an old trick known as robbing Peter to pay Paul. Essentially, he was using money from new clients to cover the losses of older ones, all while keeping up the appearance of a legitimate business. This allowed Zerosi to offer 6% interest rates on all bank deposits, which was double the average rate. However, his clients started getting suspicious when their relatives back home kept complaining they weren't receiving the money the bank was supposed to send. In mid-1908, the authorities began investigating the bank for embezzlement. 
At which point, Zerosi filled a bag with all the money he could carry and fled to Mexico, leaving his employees in the community to deal with the fallout from the scam. Not wanting to get caught up in the investigation, Ponzi figured it was time to hightail it back to the United States. But before he made his grand exit, he cooked up a dumb idea to avoid starting from scratch. He thought he'd treat himself to a little going away present by ripping off a check from one of his bank's clients, this shipping firm called the Canadian Warehousing Company. Ponzi swiped a blank check from the manager's stash and wrote it out for $423.58, thinking it was a pretty slick move. But when he tried to cash it, the eagle-eyed bank teller saw right through the phony signature and called the cops. Ponzi ended up with a three-year stint in St. Vincent de Paul prison. And guess what? That was just the beginning of his criminal career. Charles was released on parole after two years and immediately made plans to return to the States. But he didn't go alone. Instead, he took with him five Italian immigrants, all fresh off the boat with no proper papers, as he'd been paid to smuggle these men into America. Ponzi figured this would set him up with a nice quick payday now that he was a free man again. However, he got caught and was arrested once again. Still, Ponzi believed that if he pleaded guilty, the judge would go easy on him and maybe just let him off with a small fine. But when the judge slammed his gavel and passed the sentence, Ponzi's heart sank. He was given another two years in federal prison in Atlanta. After his release from prison for the second time, Ponzi found himself at a crossroads, unsure of his next move. Despite crafting various schemes to amass wealth while incarcerated, they all hinged on one critical element, money. Unfortunately, Ponzi was destitute. With limited options, he drifted from state to state, taking on odd jobs wherever he could. Eventually, he secured a position as a clerk at the J.R. Pool Company, an import-export firm based in Boston. It seemed he had circled back to where he began in North America after 15 years. Life in Boston presented a marked improvement for Ponzi during his second stint. His employment proved fulfilling, and he demonstrated competence in his role. Additionally, fate intervened when he crossed paths with Rosa Genico, a 21-year-old woman who captured his heart. Despite his elation in their newfound marital bliss, Ponzi grappled with feelings of inadequacy. While Rose found contentment in modest living, Ponzi harbored aspirations of opulence. He yearned to lavish her with luxuries beyond their means. Realizing the limitations of his clerk's salary, Ponzi made a pivotal decision six months into their marriage. He resigned from his position at J.R. Poole and embarked on a quest for a new venture. Initially, he joined his father-in-law's struggling discount fruit-selling business, buoyed by his own claims of financial acumen. However, his efforts failed to salvage the enterprise, which ultimately declared bankruptcy by year's end. Undeterred by this setback, Ponzi pivoted to establishing his own import-export business. Yet, despite his determination, the venture floundered due to Ponzi's lack of experience and connections. Undaunted, Ponzi brainstormed his next endeavor, inspired by the exorbitant costs associated with advertising his services. This sparked the concept of launching his own trade magazine, The Trader's Guide. Ponzi envisioned widespread circulation, predicting substantial advertising revenue. Bolstered by unwavering confidence, he leased a larger office and assembled a team. However, reality dealt Ponzi a harsh blow as the magazine failed to garner interest, and potential investors balked at his lofty rates. Rebuffed by the rejection, Ponzi faced further humiliation when his loan application was summarily denied by a dismissive bank president. Forced to downsize and regroup, Ponzi remained resolute in his pursuit of wealth. A turning point arrived in August 1919 when Ponzi received a letter from Spain expressing interest in the trader's guide. Alongside the request was an unfamiliar item, an international reply coupon, IRC. Intrigued by its potential, Ponzi saw an opportunity that would alter the course of his life. Enjoying this video? Smash that like button to spread the joy to even more people. Charles Ponzi's restless, cunning mind conceived the idea of arbitrage, a tactic involving the buying and selling of an asset across different markets to capitalize on price differentials and generate profit. In the case of IRCs, despite their consistent shipping value across countries, they were procured at varying prices due to local currency fluctuations. Thus, Ponzi envisioned purchasing IRCs in countries with devalued currencies, such as Italy post-war, and redeeming them in the United States for postage stamps with a higher dollar value. Subsequently, he would sell these stamps for a modest profit. 
Scaling up the operation to involve thousands, even millions of IRCs, Ponzi anticipated substantial returns. On paper, his new business plan appeared not only promising, but also entirely lawful. Arbitrage, a tried-and-true investment tactic spanning centuries, served as the cornerstone of Charles's latest venture in January 1920, the Securities Exchange Company. However, Charles's aspirations collided with harsh reality once again. Despite his optimism, the profits from arbitraging international reply coupons, IRCs, paled in comparison to the steep shipping costs incurred in their transfer between nations. Undeterred by the financial setbacks, Charles remained steadfast in his belief that this endeavor held the key to his desired life of opulence and luxury. Refusing to abandon his vision, he pivoted, transforming his failed venture into the notorious Ponzi scheme that now bears his name. After all, his plan to arbitrage IRC sounded really good, so even though it wasn't good at all, maybe he could persuade other people it would work and take their money. At its essence, the Ponzi scheme mirrors the age-old practice of robbing Peter to pay Paul, a concept Ponzi witnessed firsthand during his tenure at Banco Zarossi. This scheme entices individuals to invest by promising substantial returns within a short time frame and minimal risk. However, rather than investing the funds, the perpetrator diverts most of it for personal gain, distributing a portion as profits to early investors. Seduced by the illusion of substantial returns, these initial investors often reinvest their earnings, propagating the scheme further. Despite its simplicity, this scheme preys on human greed and financial ignorance, necessitating a continuous influx of new investments to sustain itself. Once the fraudster fails to attract sufficient new investors to meet the returns owed to earlier investors, the scheme inevitably collapses. While the scheme bears Ponzi's name, he was not its originator. Others, such as New York bookkeeper William Miller and German actress Adele Spitzetter, employed similar methods in previous decades. However, Charles Ponzi elevated the scheme to an unprecedented scale. Under Ponzi's guise, investors were promised extraordinary returns, with claims of a vast network of agents procuring IRCs worldwide. When pressed for details, Ponzi evaded disclosure, citing concerns about aiding potential competitors. The majority of banks, reputable companies, and experienced investors wisely steered clear of Ponzi's schemes, recognizing the telltale signs of offers that seemed too good to be true. However, Ponzi intentionally avoided targeting these informed individuals. Instead, he sought out those who, like himself in the past, were driven more by aspirations than prudence, constantly seeking shortcuts to wealth. His targets were often individuals lacking in financial literacy, frequently in dire need of quick cash. Ponzi came to understand that his greatest skill lay not in managing finances, but in captivating people. He adeptly marketed his business without coming across as overly forceful or assertive, creating an illusion that he was indifferent to whether or not he received their investments. Initially starting with individuals in his own neighborhood, Ponzi managed to persuade 18 of them to invest within the first month. As news of their profitable returns spread rapidly, crowds began flocking to Ponzi's office, eager to participate in what appeared to be a foolproof opportunity. With each passing month, Ponzi amassed an ever-growing clientele, ultimately generating over $250,000 per day at the peak of his enterprise. The Boston Post hailed him as a financial genius, bolstering his credibility and attracting even more investors. Consequently, Ponzi attained the extravagant lifestyle he had always envisioned, residing in a sprawling mansion, driving fast cars, donning lavish attire adorned with gold watches and diamond pins, and indulging in opulent first-class journeys. However, his reign was short-lived. Within six months of launching his venture, doubts regarding its legitimacy began to surface. Investigations were initiated. Clarence Barron, a prominent figure in financial journalism, uncovered Ponzi's scheme, exposing its glaring inconsistencies. The Boston Post's publication of Barron's findings precipitated Ponzi's downfall, triggering investor panic and prompting street protests demanding refunds. Subsequently, Ponzi was arrested by federal authorities. Although his fraudulent scheme defrauded thousands and left a lasting legacy of financial deceit, he stubbornly maintained his innocence even in the face of conviction and imprisonment. 
Ponzi's final years were marked by financial ruin, solitude, and declining health, culminating in his death in 1949. Despite his ignominious end, his name became synonymous with financial fraud, perpetuating the enduring legacy of the Ponzi scheme. Charles himself may have died penniless and alone, but his scheme lives on, perpetuated by countless con artists who followed in his footsteps. Subscribe now to stay updated on more riveting stories and uncover the hidden truths of history.